Our next speaker is, I'm going to look at my list, I know all these people very well, is uh, Melissa Pelto, and she's going to be talking about combat apathy with appreciative inquiry. living in Vancouver. So, um, appreciative inquiry, the essence behind it is to appreciate, which is to recognize the best in the people and the world around us, affirming the past and present strengths, looking at success and potential to all things that take place in the living system. And then if you have the inquiry piece, we're looking at the act of exploration and discovery and seeing new ways of possibilities. So the bulk of this discussion comes from um, a woman, Anne Perdue, who's been an inspiration for me during my studies. And then another piece, which is Watkins and Moore, who wrote a fabulous book called Appreciative Inquiry, Change at the Speed of Imagination. So it's, in essence, a theory for approaching change from a holistic perspective that looks to dramatically shape where we focus our energy. So based on the idea that a human system is imagined by the people who participate within that system, the collective pool of knowledge is there to transform the system. So this really looks to generate new ideas, creative solutions, and to step beyond some of the structural limitations. Uh, Appreciative inquiry is also really contrary to the notion of stability, and it acknowledges that we're in a constant state of flux and change. Another cornerstone piece is that it, again, embraces the positive and looks at what's going on inside of an entire system rather than just a subset. So the model I'm going to discuss today is called the 4D model, and it was uh, developed out of the GEM initiative in Zimbabwe. And my reason for being passionate about appreciative inquiry, I think through um, my being through my MA, you get overwhelmed with the idea that we're part of a larger social structure that we're in a system that's made up of macro systems and smaller systems, and so that this uh, is a way to look at some of the leverage points and make change in some of those smaller ways. And uh, this, again, came from, came from my recent studies. So uh, it embraces the idea of complexity and subjectivity. It looks as pl at planning as a process that is something that needs to be a living document and will be um, improved upon. It looks at information as a primal uh, force for creativity and looks for common threads in dialogue and acknowledges that even more and more with globalization and, and the birth of social media, that we are really a relationship-based society. So the theory of appreciative inquiry is rooted in social constructionism, so looking at how we have the power to create the images that create reality in our own world. And by constantly focusing on a deficit, in resources or in ideas, we create more of the same problem that, that got us into the deficit or proposed perceived deficit in the beginning rather than the solution. So by focusing on the negative, we also are failing to empower people to be creative and to find a different way of doing things. So it's a very useful approach for organizational change in that organizations are essentially human systems. So when you're talking about change, it can be change in work, change in mandate, change in how an organization relates to their customers, um, change of a cultural or uh, organization's culture, um, or even just change for our attitude towards adapting to change. So there's five core principles to appreciative inquiry, and this the paramount one that I think lays the foundation for all others is that it's choosing to focus on the positive as um, the central piece for your inquiry. It looks at using individual stories and people's experience to learn more about what their life force is and what really juices them. And so from doing that, then it generates images, new images of what the future could bring, and that permits for lots of innovation when you're drawing from that creative commons. So often you see organizations or even individuals, because I think this is something that plays at an organizational level and then at a personal level as well. You see um, the idea of how are we going to fix the small piece that's not working rather than building on what's working. So an example, you do a customer satisfaction survey and you get fantastic marks in this area, this area, this area, and then you turn around and you spend the bulk of your resources trying to fix the 20% that is not proportionate to what's going well. 
So it's it's building it's building on what's going well. And I think this is also another really positive way to uh, engage the stakeholders of your organization as well. So the 4D model has four stages. 4D is four stages. So it looks at discovery, dream, um, design, and delivery. And so the discovery stage really focuses on looking at where people see excellence, what they're most proud of, and asking the right kind of questions and creating a space for people to have those kinds of powerful discussions. And again, storytelling, um, which I think is often an over or an underused um, tactic, is really powerful and appreciative inquiry, and especially during the discovery phase. So by asking people about what the high points are, you end up uncovering that core piece, what keeps people engaged, what keeps people juiced, where their values lie, and what people want to bring most to the future. So the second stage is the dream stage. And this is inquiring about what an ideal future could look like. So instead of what it does look like or what you wish it did, in an ideal state, what could your organization or even your life look like? So looking at engaging your stakeholders in conversations about where the organization's potential lies or where your individual potential lies. Looking at um, thinking about great thoughts and looking about uncovering the hidden potential in your organization. And from doing that, you shift from that idea of a deficit and you start to move towards a new narrative, which is again rooted in social constructionism. And so this is both practical in that it's grounded in a history, but it is generative in that it looks to do possibilities. So the third phase of this is about co-constructing the future. And I think that that's a really key part of this as well, is that it's about a dialogue. And so in building and drawing from the collective commons and the creative commons, like what we're doing in this room, you are able to create a, um, a new vision. So it can be ideas around best leadership, best kinds of strategies, or what sort of structures need to be in place to facilitate this. And it's very explicit discussions around what kind of behavior this could look like, or what are the key qualities that will facilitate this. And often the dream and design phase go hand in hand. So then when we move to delivery, we're talking more about what we need to do in order to sustain these changes and to put them into practice. So how do we deliver these new images of the future? Um, how are we incorporating a vision into, into an organization's mission? And so this is a real time of creativity and innovation. And again, it needs to be a flexible process that can adjust for improvisations as they come, and especially as new people are, are integrated into an organization, to bring them into that and to draw from their creativity as well. So I believe that this is a new lens that can be applied to, again, personal, uh, you know, individual assistance to organizations, and it allows people to be empowered to decide and design what their own organizations or the working life could look like. So collectively, we have the power and creativity to, to make change. And so this, um, I think this is one of the most exciting ideas that I've come across for a while. And if you want more information on this, I think the best resource I've found is called the Appreciative Inquiry Commons. And it's a website based in New York City. So thank you.